Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the courtyard in the Pentagon for DOD's annual Lab Day. Labs from across each of the military services to bring some of their best uh, technology and brightest minds here to talk to senior military leaders as well as folks in the building and media. We're here at the AFRL enclosure, the Air Force uh, Research Laboratory, to talk to uh, Colonel Michael Seal, uh, who is uh, one of the artificial intelligence uh, uh, and autonomy uh, folks at uh, Air Force uh, Research Lab. Colonel, you know, you've had a lot of general and, and flag officers here. Artificial intelligence is on everybody's mind about how it's going to change life. 5G, of course, and then the entire cyber domain. And, and uh, you know, there's a great Atlantic Council conference just a couple of days ago that focused on that. Talk to us a little bit about how military leadership need to think about artificial intelligence you know, what its enabling elements are, and that in many respects it's it's not a, a, the panacea that some people make it out to be. You know, as, as you go preaching artificial intelligence to folks, what are some of the key things that folks have to bear in mind? Well, pro the primary thing I want people to bear in mind is that AI really is a process, not a panacea. To implement AI effectively, you have to your organization or activity has to get its hands around the four infrastructures of AI: people, algorithms, data, and computational resources. It falls short of any one of those, and you have an interesting project that goes nowhere. So within the DoD construct, we really want to think about that in just terms of mission execution. We have our people operating on a computer network, on computer hardware that they've been authorized to work on, and they're working on that because that's where the data they need to use to accomplish their mission resides. That's three out of four. That leaves our fourth one, algorithms, a little bit out in the cold. Because in a, it's in, a, in a field that's advancing as fast as artificial intelligence does, a lot of the best advances and capabilities really live at the level of code base, not formal software yet. So if you want to ingest things quickly, you have to be able to deal with that algorithmic piece. And that is something that our cybersecurity and information assurance construct really doesn't do. So what the Air Force Cognitive Engine seeks to do is provide a software platform as an environment to ingest algorithmic advances and then form a technology transition bridge so we can glue together all four infrastructures and still leave in the three infrastructures where we have success hanging out in the cold. So once we can if we close that loop on on the infrastructures, now we can actually engage in the process. So it's the process before the process. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, we're talking now uh, just a couple of days uh, or about a week uh, since the Air Force released its 2030 Science and Technology Plan. Secretary Wilson, Heather Wilson, the Secretary of the Air Force, unveiled that. Talk to us about how you fit into um, the th that plan because you're one of the capabilities that actually spans across each and every single one of those capabilities rather than residing in only one of them. Right. So artificial intelligence is a very much ubiquitous and spanning construct, but it really lies most effectively inside the rapid effective decision making activity when we consider activities done by algorithms, done by machines in the background, done by robotic process automation as actually being decisions as well. Um, even the automat simple automatic control, classic control theory, closed loop analog control, is actually a decision making process. Observations are made and an output is selected based on that. Now, they can be very rigid, whereas where a human can be very flexible, and artificial intelligence, today's narrow AI, really lies in between those two activities for the most part. So it's much more flexible than a fixed algorithm, really not as dynamic as a person, although it can generate new knowledge and new ideas or methods of achieving a solution that a person, thought, at least people to date, haven't thought of because it's based on a set of observations that the AI has available and a different worldview, basically, that has been developed in the model training process. Because it wasn't explicitly trained or programmed, it was the, the, the model that it's using as decision making, if you will, is developed. Um, you know, you, you raised something interesting in terms of analog control because there's a, there are folks who believe that artificial intelligence is something brand new. But it's actually something we've been living with for a very long time, hasn't it? As it's evolving to perhaps another plane, but that we've been living with it for a very long period of time, haven't we? Absolutely. The fact that we don't talk about it in those terms really belies the fact that we have routinely deferred decisions to machines in our daily life and then to computers beyond mechanic, really mechanical machines for quite some time. We're, we're actually quite comfortable with it, we just don't think about it that way. And I think some of that comes from the conflation of all artificial intelligence, which is a subfield of computer science, it's just math, with the artificial general intelligence concept, which can be a little bit more scary. 
Um, but when it comes to, for example, uh, you know, weaponization, I don't want to necessarily get into this, but actually a, a lot of our systems are already using their onboard programming to make actually relatively complex decisions even in a weapon cycle. Well, if you want to take a historical example, an original AIM-9A Sidewinder is an autonomous weapon. When it's released off the rail, it sometimes chooses to track the designated target, and it used to sometimes track the sun. Right. <laughs> That's, that's a good, good way of putting it. it. You know, it's like, right, it's seeking its, uh, its heat source. So, so give us from, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, a very robust debate about where the United States stands vis-a-vis -vis some of its uh, competitors. Obviously, the question comes up as, as China. As somebody who's engaged in this field, you know, how do you look at this dynamic advantage? You know, where you see a potential adversary having an advantage? And what do you see as some clear advantages that the United States and its allies have you know, even if there isn't a, you know, 20% national S&T investment goal that's going into AI, you know, how do you, how do you see this space as a military person, but also an engineer and a scientist who's working in the field? So strategically, we have to consider winning an AI contest, which may have been sort of declared, as a multifaceted construct. So there's the race to develop the next most amazing algorithm, the next advance in the science of AI. But there's also the race to apply AI the most effectively, which when you consider that that has to be a possibility or companies would, be, would not be making billions of dollars per year applying AI that exists today, the question becomes who's going to win that race first? Who's going to develop the organizational structures to transition artificial intelligence advances the most effectively and the most quickly? Faster is not always better, but we do have to win the total construct. And that's where there's a little bit of a disparity of advantage. If you, in a more authoritative construct where you can make changes dynamically by fiat, that you can make certain things happen quickly. But that same construct tends to run against creati creativity and low level innovation. So ultimately, we have to listen to our airmen. We take the demand signal for let me innovate in this way, let me move forward in this way, and listen to that from a policy level and start tweaking the construct to enable some of that more quickly. And some of it, you see responses from the service laboratories and from various entities that look at the policy space, the regulation space, and we don't try to evade those regulations. We try to work within our space in new ways. The Air Force Cognitive Engine is, a, is an example of that, where what we're trying to do is address the certification and accreditation aspects of network security, not circumvent them, while simultaneously bringing in advances more quickly and enabling innovation to run faster down to the units that need it. And, and so tell us a little bit uh, about uh, ACE, the Air Force uh, Cognitive Engine. Yeah, so the Air Force Cognitive Engine is a software platform to enable AI innovation. So it's fundamentally driving against goals set down by Dr. Greg Zacharias in Autonomous Horizons The Way Forward or Autonomous Horizons 2, depending on who you ask on that. And what we're trying to reach are some very lofty architectural requirements to take on very great flexibility in what kinds of algorithms we can ingest into a common software environment and manage the intercommunication of those agents and algorithms within the space while keeping the bounds on it on the bookends to meet our accreditation goals. So there's software engineering research going on here in addition to some of our AI algorithmic research that's being done to support demonstrations and in incremental drops to demonstrate the value of the concept. And uh, let me ask you uh, the last question, which is, you know, you, you're uh, clearly an evangelist when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence. We were making jokes on, you know, what sort of religious material you would need to do that or any direction you may have to face uh, for, for prayer. But uh, talk to us a little bit about what are, what are the misconceptions you continuously correct people on? You've heard from some of the senior most general officers who are in the building who've come by and talked to you. Uh, you do this as a profession. What, what are the misperceptions and, and the misunderstandings or, you know, different ways that you want people to be thinking about this space to make the most of it, both societally but as a military? Right. I don't like to poke people in the eye on the misconceptions. I generally just try to explain some of the realities of artificial intelligence, which is artificial intelligence intrinsically exists inside a continuous improvement process. So when we start looking at making an AI solution to a problem, the first question is, what are you doing today? Do we have to get our hands around the problem and our process that we're already using to try to address it? Understand that. Understand where the data that we're using to drive those decisions comes from. Maybe backtrack to cleaning up that data or changing the process that we use to generate that data so that the generation process is either seamless to those generating it or at least provides value back to them on a recurring basis. Otherwise, our end users and our data providers are our biggest 
biggest data poisoners. But if we address those concepts in terms of continuous improvement process, we find that we make changes towards AI readiness that deliver value to our process even if we don't actually do an AI solution, if we stop at robotic process automation, if we stop at better data analytics, if we stop at, we just improved our process and we're doing better, we're buying back readiness. So going for a moonshot that says AI is going to deliver this amazing capability cold never really works. And every writer and much more esteemed uh, doc, uh, professor of this concept than I am will tell you don't do moonshots. We start with where we are and we build it up because it's the, in that building process of improving the processes we use and the way we use and think about data towards a real activity that slowly changes the culture of how our workforce engages with data. And that starts to build the trust in autonomy and automation, the belief and value of managing data. And that's how you build that forward organizationally. Um, that begs uh, one uh, question, though, on autonomy, and it's my this is my last question. Um, you know, we were talking to Jason Pusey over uh, the at the Army uh, Development Commands uh, at the Army Research Lab, who does autonomous systems, and he was he was saying, look, you know, it's a very very sophisticated robot. It can pick a backpack out. You know, it can find a backpack in a space, but it's you know getting into the room. You and I don't think about the hundreds of different kinds of doorknobs we run into, right? We have to program that in. Does the door open in or out? Things that we intuitively don't even look necessarily like we know, oh, this door goes in or this goes, the door, go, do, door goes out. When you look at AI and you look at autonomy, what, how much more work do we have to do? Because the notion of fully autonomous systems to operate in a complex battle space is, you know, it's like when you start to pick it apart, you realize how complicated it is, whether it's in undersea, whether it's on land, sea surface may be a little bit easier because the terrain is, but you could easily hit something that's just under the terrain, right? A cargo container or something like that. So as you look at this sort of space, what is the realistically executable AI autonomy future? Because folks are talking about this as sort of a limitless sort of thing. And if you look at it, that's kind of a challenge that's dependent on software programming data, you know, computing speed as, as your, you know, Michael Fanto, we talked to him about how quantum changes that. Talk to us a little bit about this nexus and how we need to think about that space because there's this tendency of thinking that this sort of wholly autonomous future is right around the corner and, and it would appear that for some of these applications it's a little harder to do than not. In most cases, I would conjecture that the autonomous future we'll have is a future of teaming with autonomy, human machine teaming with autonomous systems. And those systems aren't necessarily going to be physical systems like a robot, but autonomous agents inside a computer environment, uh, autonomous activities in our command and control structures where some decisions are being made by, the com by computational methods rather than by human direct human intervention. But to do that, we have to generate trust in autonomy, which really means from an AI perspective, perspective, explainable AI. The modern second wave AI, neural network centric, has problems with explainability because it winds up being something of a black box. That's where a number of research areas are focused on trying to correct that, on trying to improve the status of those things. But I would hearken back to earlier first wave AI of expert systems that deliver value every day. These are rules-based systems, and those rules might be developed by individual experts coding it, or by actually machine learning driven processes that generate multiple values and test those. So the level of, when we talk about a future with autonomy, it's really not a future dominated strictly by things going off doing their own thing without input or engagement, that's wholly unacceptable. The future of autonomy is really linked very tightly to the ability of autonomous systems to work with us inside a teaming construct. Especially when it comes to weapons release and in weapons. In particular in terms of we weapons release and, dire and direct action activities. But there are, other, there are other command and control decisions that are equally as important that don't involve a weapons release, that someone has to make that call. And that's a case where we would need the peer task and cognitive flexibility for an agent to be in the driver's seat up to a certain point, then take a human input, having given the COAs or possibilities or recommendations, and then once given that COA, continue on. And that's probably actually a host of algorithms or agents running together as an autonomous team itself, right. teaming together, not a single master algorithm. United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel uh, Michael Seal, who is the director of the Autonomous, Capab Autonomous Capability Team 3 at Air Force uh, Research Lab. Absolute pleasure, uh, Colonel. Thanks very much. Best, best of luck. Uh, just absolutely fascinating and, uh, and uh, look forward to talking again in the future. Thank you.